understanding that are acceptable and do not contradict the other approaches to these churches. But uh, what we're going to look at here, and the reason that we're going to look at this study here this evening is to try to set the table for the following study. But what we're going to look at here this evening, though the many of the early pioneers understood this, this would not be threatening to them, but I'm going to try to share tonight. It's generally um, a new approach, we'll say, to Adventists, and, and sometimes the Adventists but here this is the first time your, your head swims a little bit, but just relax, it's not that, it's not that hard, okay? And you'll see where we're going um, in a moment. Let's, let's start with this quote from Signs of the Times, July 4th, 1906. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament, I'm on page 125. The, the, the last book of the New Testament is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. The book of Revelation, in connection with the book of Daniel, demands close study. Let every God-fearing teacher consider how, clear, how most clearly to comprehend and present the gospel that our Savior came in person to make known to his servant John. Notice that she's named the book of Revelation here is the gospel. Mm -hmm. name known to his servant John. It's not going to stop there. We're going to make a couple more, more points about the gospel, but just put that in, in your memory bank. Then she quotes from Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And we've been working upon the critical principles throughout this prophecy school, but the prophets were speaking more about the end of the world and the days in which they live. So the things that are shortly to come to pass are the things that are shortly to come to pass in this generation. This is the final generation. None should become discouraged in their study of Revelation because of its apparently mystic symbols, mystical symbols. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We are to proclaim to the world the great and solemn truths contained in the book of Revelation. Into the very designs and principles of the church of God, these truths are to enter. There should be a closer and more diligent study of this book, and more earnest presentations presentation of the truth it contains, truths which concern all who are living in these last days. All who pre are premier, preparing to meet their Lord should make this book the subject of casual study and prayer. Earnest, Earnest study and prayer. It is just what the name signifies, a revelation of the most important events. Remember, she's saying that this is the gospel. <clears throat> Is just what it, the name signifies, a revelation of the most important events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. John, because of his faithful trust in the word of God and the testimony of Christ, was banished to the Isle of Patmos, but his banishment did not separate him from Christ. The Lord visited his faithful servant in his banishment and gave him instruction regarding what was to come upon the world. This instruction is of the greatest importance to us, for we are living in the last days of earth's history. <clears throat> Soon we shall enter upon the fulfillment of the events which Christ showed John were to take place. As the messengers of the Lord present these solemn truths, they must realize that they are handling subjects of eternal interest, and they should seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they may speak not their own words, but the words given them by God. Amen. The book of Revelation must be opened to the people. Amen. Many have been taught that it is a sealed book, but it is sealed to those only who reject truth and light. Amen. The truth that it contains must be proclaimed, that the people may have an opportunity to prepare for the events which are soon to take place. The third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for the salvation of a perishing world. Amen. The perils of the last days are upon us, and in our work we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. Let not the solemn scenes that prophecy has revealed are soon to take place, 
be left untouched. We are God's messengers, and we have no time to lose. Those who will be co-workers with our Lord Jesus Christ will show a deep interest in the truths found in this book. With pen and voice, they will strive to make plain the wonderful things that Christ came from heaven to reveal. We have a responsibility to portray clearly the solemn events that are in the book of Revelation. And this is the third angel's message. And this is the gospel. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the names of the seven churches, next quote, are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Christ is spoken of of as walking in the midst of the seven of the golden candlesticks. This is symbolized, his, thus is symbolized his relation to the churches. He is in constant communication with his people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion. Although he is a high priest and medi mediator in the sanctuary above, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth. And we're to follow Christ whithersoever he goes. And as he's walking up and down in the midst of the golden candlesticks, he's walking up, down, through these seven churches. And we're to follow him through these churches. And these churches represent the seven different periods of the Christian era. And as we follow Christ by faith through these, through these histories, we are to learn what these histories are. That's why he's walking through them. Because these histories have a direct bearing on the last days of Earth's history. Uh, we had a discussion here before this meeting, before we went and ate, and I brought up one point about a paper that I, that I addressed briefly before Jamal's sermon, that the theological argument on that paper that was attacking the pioneer position of the trumpets was, was one that is often used by people that attack the pioneer position of the trumpet and their theological premise that they set in place is that the book of Revelation is to be studied in order. Okay? But I tell you what, and they have, they have quotes from Sister Pike where she talks about the events of Revelation taking place in their order. So they use those quotes to say that we're supposed to study Revelation from beginning to end in order, and when they do that, then they can use that principle to take certain passages in Revelation and destroy the pioneer understanding. But what they cannot do is consistently apply that false premise. If you try to take the book of Revelation from beginning to end and say that this is sequential history that starts in chapter 1 and goes all the way to chapter 22, you just can't do it. This is a technique that's used to attack the truth. Okay, and the reason I'm making this point is the top of page 127. Miller's Rules. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scripture upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. Right. And my point is, she's going to give an endorsement here to William Miller's Rules, and William Miller's Rules deny the thought that you approach prophecy on a continuous line. The Millerites understood the rule of repeat and enlarge. So when you build a premise to say that we're supposed to study Revelation sequentially, and especially when you use that premise just to pick certain passages to uh, sustain your own pre preconceived ideas, you are not using the rules of William Miller. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study interpretation. Then she quotes the first five rules of William Miller's Rules of Prophetic Interpretation, and she says, The above is a portion of these rules, and in our study of the Bible we shall do all we shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. This is divine endorsement upon the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller. And underneath, you will see a quote from William Miller um, on the, the seven churches, the seven seals. We'll read this. 
The Seven Churches of Asia is a history of the Church of Christ in her seven forms, in all her windings and turnings, in all her prosperity and adversity, from the days of the Apostles down to the end of the world. The Seven Seals are a history of the transactions of the powers and kings of the earth over the Church, and God's protection of his people during the same time. The seven trumpets are a history of seven peculiar and heavy judgments set upon the earth by the Roman Empire. And the seven vials are the seven last plagues sent upon papal Rome. Mixed with these are many other events woven in like tributary streams and filling up the grand river of prophecy until the whole ends up in the ocean of eternity. I like it when Brother Miller gets a little bit flowery. <laughs> this, to me, is the plan of John's prophecy in the book of Revelation. And the man who wishes to understand this book must have a thorough knowledge of other parts of the Word of God. The figures and metaphors used in this prophecy are not all explained in the same, but must be found in other prophets and explained in other passages of Scripture. Therefore, it is evident that God has, God has designed the study of the whole even to obtain a clear knowledge of any part. Uriah Smith, speaking of the churches in the seal, says, The seals are introduced in, to our notice in the 4th, 5th, and 6th chapters of Revelation. The scenes presented under these seals are brought to view in Revelation 6 and in the first verse of Revelation 8. They evidently cover events with which the church is connected from the opening of this dispensation to the coming of Christ. While the seven churches present the internal history of the church, the seven seals bring to view the great <coughs> events of his external history. I, I put that in there because I like, I push it the way to express that. The churches are representing the internal situation of the church, the seals dealing with the external. And, but he's saying that because he's, he understands that these are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarged. The seven churches are repeated and enlarged upon with the seven seals. Second line of prophecy, adding a different component to the whole picture. Amen. Now we had a discussion fairly late in the night for, for someone like Kathy and I, who usually um, fall asleep around 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And we were talking about the churches and the seals and the trumpets, and a friend had a, a, a little bit of a different take on these than I did. And one of the points where we were um, where we we're trying to seek some clarity is, I pointed out to him that, as I understand it, in the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, there is a pers purposeful division, and there is. And I think when you see a pur purposeful division in Scripture, it's you have to note it and see if the Lord reveals to you what it represents. And it's an easy division to see. When it comes to the first four seals, they are horses, they are beasts. And in the first four seals, you have the, the call, come and see. But in the, the last three seals, you don't have the, the beasts, nor do you have the call to come and see. So in the seven seals, you have a purposeful distinction between the first four and the last three. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Also, in the seven trumpets, you have this... Can we open the door? We feel like we're going to pass out. And I'm, I'm just repeating the question. I'm not taking the position because I know that we had this discussion. I'm not going to be held accountable. Which, which door was the issue? It gets really, really buggy in here, and that's why we were close enough. Let's well, let's uh, 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 let's take let's try to do it halfway. Let's crack. Or is that one crack? Let's open it a little bit and see if we can get a little bit of a breeze through, and maybe that will solve the problem, and we won't get so many bugs. Okay. Turn off the lights. I mean, that's not really. That bad idea as far as the bug problem, but I don't know what it does to the video production or if we have to go to court. Are you, are you ready? Or your Bibles? So, what I'm saying as we approach our consideration of the churches and the seals. 
and the opening of the seventh seal, which is, you know, I, I hope, I, I assume that everyone that's in here has discovered a little jewel in God's room. Even if it's just a, some personal edification. I know everyone's had that Amen. Sometimes you find these little ones in there, you don't deserve them, and they're, they're beyond you're deserving them, but they're still good. Even, but they're really small. And sometimes you come across them, which is really. <laughs> It's, it's, at least from your human perspective, it seems large. And brothers and sisters, the opening of the seventh seal, it seems large. It seems large. And we hope to get to that tomorrow, but in order to get to it intelligently, we have to deal with these churches and get in place. And what we're saying about these churches and the seals and the trumpets is that they're governed upon the principle of repeat and large. And the first thing that we're taking note of is that there is a 4-3 division. The first four seals, we have the call to come and see. The last three do not. And the first four trumpets are trumpets. And the last three trumpets are woes. They're trumpets, true, but they're woes. Now the testimony of two things established. So you can read that back into the seven churches. But the pioneers also understood that the first four churches were set apart from the last three churches because the pioneers believed that Sardis, Philadelphia, and the Odyssey all operated during the Millerite experience. And this will be repeated at the end of the world. The pioneers believed that the faithful Millerites were the Philadelphians, the foolish virgins of the Millerite history were the Laodiceans, and they were giving their message to the people in Sardis. Uh, they had other understandings too, but they did note this division of 4-3. And at the end of the world, in Adventism, there will be wise and foolish virgins, Laodiceans and Philadelphians, that are being prepared to give a message to those people outside of Adventism, which is represented by Sardis. And one of the definitions of Sardis is those that escape. So you can see this. If you're following this prophetic message, you can see these three people these three churches in Adventism at the end of the world in Daniel 11, verse 41. Because in Daniel 11, verse 41, at the Sunday Law in the United States, the Philadelphians of Adventism are going to receive the seal of God, and the Laodiceans of Adventism are going to receive the mark of the beast, and those that are represented by Edom and Moab and Ammon that escape the hand of the papacy, that's what Sardis means. Those that escape. So in verse 41, you have Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Sardis just as the pioneers recognized them as being all contemporary in their history. So, with a correct understanding, you can see that the churches, the seals, and the trumpets are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, and that there is a 4-3 division in those three lines of prophecy. Okay? That's the point, isn't it? By the experience of those churches, the experience, sort of, Philadelphia? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, that's what, what I'm dealing with, is not, I'm not denying that these seven churches are the seven, the breakdown of seven periods of church history right. from the beginning to the end. The, these, where I started was, is that these seven churches have different levels of truth. I'm not denying the correct understanding that we have that these seven churches represent the history of the Christian dispensation. On the top of page 128, James White from Review and Herald, February 12, 1857, says this, We have now traced the churches, the seals, and the beasts of living beings as far as they will compare as covering the same period of time. The seals are seven in number, the beasts but four. And it may be well here, notice, here to notice that at the opening of the first, second, third, or fourth seals, the first, second, third, and fourth beasts are heard to say, Come and see. But when the fifth, sixth, and seventh seals are opened, there is no such voice heard. Neither do the last three churches and the last three seals compare as covering the same periods of time as the first four churches and the first four seals do. But as we have shown, the churches, seals, and beasts do agree as covering the same period of time for the space of nearly 1,800 years, till we come down to a little more than half a century of the present time. James White is saying that the first four seals, 
run a parallel with the first four churches, but when you get to the last three seals in the last three churches, this consecutive uh, parallel history stops. And this is to be noticed and noted, because I believe it seems like it's most certainly correct. So now we're at the, the point where I, we want to when we're going to demonstrate something to you. It's best if we are at the point in this room well, where we are not drinking the milk of God's word. And by that I mean where we, don't, we aren't required to do, take a lot of time <coughs> to define these churches. I know that there are some of us in this room that are not even Seventh-day Adventists. So we don't, we're not all yet beyond the milk. And the best we can do is apologize because we gotta keep it at a, at a level of understanding where we don't have to define everything. And what I am saying is that we're gonna deal with the church of Pergamos and Thyatira. Some of these churches have a cause and effect relationship. Ephesus and Ephesus cannot be separated from Smyrna. Smyrna is the church that was persecuted. Ephesus is the church that of Pentecostal power that carried the gospel to the world. It was living godly, and the rule is, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Amen. The effect of Ephesus is that it brought about Smyrna. Follow what I mean by cause and effect? Amen. So too with Pergamus and Thyatira. Pergamus is the, the Christian church that's going into compromise with paganism, and the compromise of the time period represented by Pergamos is what prepares the way for the papal church, which is represented by Thyatira. So Pergamos and Thyatira are connected. You don't separate those two histories. Follow me? Yes. Okay, so if in your notes, I'm going to show you some other lines of history where Pergamus and Thyatira are represented. And after we show some of those lines of history, then we're going to try to do something with those lines of history. You can look at it in your Bible, or you can take it right here from your notes, under 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. It says, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what was told us, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, and what's the mystery of iniquity? Papacy. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let us will let, or he who restrains the papacy, the mystery of iniquity. And who's the he that restrains the mystery of iniquity? Rome. Pagan Rome. Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked, the papacy, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Brothers and sisters, this isn't simply the passage where William Miller comes, comes to understand that the daily represents paganism. This is the history that's showing the relationship between pagan Rome and the papacy. And this history where that is fulfilled in the time period represented in Revelation as Pergamus and Thyatira. You see it? The compromise of Constantine is what's taken away in order to place Thyatira, the mystery of iniquity, on the throne of the earth. So Pergamus and Thyatira are one line of prophecy, and Second Thessalonians here is the second line of the same history. Okay? Okay? Next quote from Revelation 13, 2. By the way, I have never found, for my, for my personal study, I stand to be correct on this because I know I have not seen every line of prophecy. But I've never found a line of prophecy that lays upon another line of prophecy where the second line tells the identical thing. Okay, When the Lord takes one line of prophecy and brings another line upon it and another line upon it, all those lines that are telling the identical history are teaching a different aspect of that history. They're building a picture. So remember that as we're looking at these lines, because we're going to continue to look at the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. Revelation 13, 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and his great authority. The dragon, who's the dragon here? Pagan Rome. 
And who's it given the power of Satan authority to? So this, once again, is Pergamos and Thyatira. In fact, this is giving us some details about their relationship because it's telling us that in the year 330, Constantine gave the seat of authority to the papacy. In the year 533, Justinian gave the civil authority to the papacy. And in the year 496, Clovis gave the military power to the papacy. That's that's what's being told in Revelation 13, too, where Second Thessalonians is telling about pagans and being taken away in order that we can understand the book of Daniel. Each line is giving us a little bit of insight on the same history. Daniel 8, 11, and 12. <clears throat> Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground of the practice and prosper. This passage here is talking about the relationship, the history between pagan Rome and papal Rome. Okay? Uh, the first verse is saying that Pagan Rome magnified itself against Christ at his birth and in his death. And from pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was lifted up and exalted. And the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary, which was the city of Rome, and the sanctuary of the Pantheon Temple, was cast down by Constantine in the year 330. And the next verse says that an army, a host, was given the papacy against the three horns the, the daily resistance that was being raised against papal rise by reason of transgression, the transgression that allowed the papacy to take control of Clovis army and the other armies of Europe was the combination of church and state, and the papacy cast the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered for 1260 years. This passage is another parallel line to Pergamus and Thyatira. Do you see that? Okay. Here's another one, Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that paganism is removed at the Battle of the Visigoths in the year 508, in order to set the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538, there shall be 1290 years that brings you to 1798. Once again, identifying a line of prophecy that deals with in term in terms of the book of Revelation? Okay. Do you see these are all lines of prophecy about Pergamus and Thyatira? Here's another one. Daniel eleven thirty and thirty one. These are all the daily prophecies. Yeah. But they're all there. None of them are redundant. Okay. But this is this is not about the daily. No, no, okay. I suppose it is about the day in some respects. For the, sh the ships of Chittim, and what's the ships of Chittim? Vandals. What trumpet is this? The second trumpet. For the second trumpet shall come against pagan Rome. Therefore, pagan Rome is going to be grieved and return to the city of Constantinople and, and carry out a war against God's word. He's going to have indignation against the Holy Covenant. He shall do that. He'll return to Constantinople, and pagan Rome will have intelligence. He'll open up the dialogue with the Antichrist, the Bible prophecy, the, the church that has forsaken the Holy Covenant. And arms, military strength, will stand up for the papacy, and those arms during the warfare that takes place from 496 to 538 will pollute the sanctuary strength. They will attack the city of Rome over and over again, and those arms, the, the powers of the European kings, will place the papacy on the throne of the earth in the year 538. Once again, what is this history giving you? Pergamus and Thyatira. Okay? How many lines is that? One, two, one, two three, four, five, six. Now, here's where we're going to try to do something. We're going to read a quote from Sister Black. It has to do with Daniel 11, but it's really not about Daniel 11 that we're dealing with at this point. She says, we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. 
in the 30th verse, and we just read the 30th verse. We just read the 30th verse of Daniel 11, and the, 30th, and the 31st, and we agreed, although you seem a little bit subdued, I don't know if it's the heat, or you just don't know where I'm going with this, but you agreed that verse 30 and 31 was Pergamus and Thyatira. So she's going to quote, she just emphasized that the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, and she's emphasizing the rule that history is going to be repeated, history that's in Daniel chapter 11, and then she specifically identifies verses 30 to 36, and she quotes verses 30 to 36. She says, in the 30th verse, the poor power is spoken of, that shall be great. And she quotes verses 30 to 36, and then she says, when she finished that quote, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. So what is she saying? She's saying that verses 30 to 36 are repeated at the end of the world. Or she's saying, if you want to just take a section of it, she's saying that verses 30 and 31 is repeated at the end of the world. Which means, brothers and sisters, verses 30 to 31, we've agreed, is Pergamus and Thyatira. Pergamus and Thyatira are repeated in the history of Laodicea. Amen. Of course, this is the Advent message. This is the Advent message. We know that Protestant America falls away and parallels the role of pagan Rome and returns the papacy to the throne of the earth, and that's Pergamus and Thyatira. But sometimes we don't realize that all seven of the churches are repeated in Laodicea. All we've shown you at this point is that Pergamus and Thyatira are repeated in Laodicea. And if this is so, it is. Remember, the first four seals parallel the first four churches. So if all the churches are repeated in the final church of Laodicea, what's that tell us about the seal? So, the third and fourth seal, Revelation 6, verse 6 through 8. The third and fourth seal, brothers and sisters, what is that? What's it parallel? It parallels Pergamus and Thyatira. Right? Is that how you understand it as the seventh day Adventist? The black horse and the pale horse of the third and fourth seal is Pergamus and Thyatira. And I, and I heard a voice, pardon me, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, which just finishing the third seal, and now you're moving into the fourth seal. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed him. And power was given unto him over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. This is the third part of the and all the fourth seal. And it parallels Pergamus and Thyatira. <coughs> Notice what Sister White says. From Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 7. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to look to open the book, neither to look thereon. There in his open hand lay the book, the roll of the history of God's providence, the prophetic history of nations in the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his law, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all the ruling powers in the nations. And the symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. <coughs> this earth was written within and without, John says, and then she quotes the verses that we just read, among some other verses, and she says, the same spirit is seen today that is represented in Revelation 6, 6 through 8, that's the third and the fourth seal, and she says, history is to be repeated, that which has been will be again. Pergamus and Thyatira, the third and fourth seal, are repeated in the history of the seal. Ephesus and Smyrna. 
2 Timothy 3.12, we've mentioned, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 397 says, Many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in the defense of truth. Amen. Paul in the text tells us that when the righteousness of Christ is perfected in his people during the loud cry, that that experience will be is represented by the church of Ephesus and it will bring about the effect of Smyrna. And that, that's what we're getting at here. Um, and we've, we've read more than once and referred to several times. That's why I don't have it written in the notes. I just have it cited in the notes. Early writings, page 259 through 261. This is the, the two paragraphs that we've spoken about. It is in your notes, perhaps more than once where she talks about the history of Christ and says all those that would not receive the teachings of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus and those that rejected the teachings of Jesus went still further to crucify him and they could not see their way into the holy place and the Jews were left in perfect darkness and then she goes into the next paragraph and she talks about the same progressive testing process in the time of the Millerites. Those who would not receive the Jesus <coughs> message would not be benefited by the second, neither could they be benefited by the midnight cry that was to prepare them to enter by faith in the most holy place. We're all familiar with that reading in early writings, page 259, right? Yeah. Sister White is doing what there? She's comparing Ephesus with who? Philadelphia. Ephesus is repeated in Philadelphia. Of course, we have spent a great deal of time here this past few days identifying, and so far I think all of us that have been here have not argued this point. We've spent a great deal of time here pointing out that the Millwright history is repeated to the very letter in the history of 144,000. Amen? Amen. Amen. And the Millwright history is the history of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And the history of the 144,000 is. So if the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000, then Philadelphia is repeated in the history of Laodicea. And Ephesus is repeated in the history of Philadelphia. So if Philadelphia is repeated in Laodicea, what else is repeated in Laodicea? Ephesus. But you can't bring Ephesus down to Laodicea without bringing who? Smyrna. Because all those that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. So Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Philadelphia are all repeated in Laodicea. As well as the corresponding seal. Do you see brothers and sisters? You know what's interesting? I'm not ready to tell you it's interesting. <laughs> Um, Southern Watchman, March 21st, 1904, Christ Object Lesson, page 170. Somebody has a very good idea, but it seems to be limited. Christ Object Lessons, page 170. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen from the street, and equity cannot enter. The truth fell with him that departeth from evil, and maketh himself a prey. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. This was fulfilled in the life of Christ on earth. He was loyal to the commandments, setting aside the human traditions and requirements, which had been exalted in their place. Because of this, he was hated and persecuted. This history is repeated. Ephesus is repeated. When? The work of John the Baptist and those and the work of those who in the last days go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to arouse the people from their apathy are in many respects the same. His work is a type of the work that must be done in this age. What age? They have to see it. This is 1905. <coughs> at least um, almost 50 years in the day of the sea. Minimum. Christ is to come a second time and judge the world in righteousness. The messengers of God who bear the last message of warning to be given to the 
world are to prepare the way for Christ's second advent as John prepared the way for his first advent. In this preparatory work, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places made plain for history is to be repeated. And once again, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. In this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ and the clouds of heaven, all of God calls for men who will prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. Just such a, a work as that which John did was to be carried on in these last days. The Lord is given, me, given giving messages to his people through the instruments he has chosen, and he would have all the ammunitions and warnings he sends. The message preceding the public ministry of Christ was repent publicans and sinners, repent Pharisees and Sadducees, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our message is not to be one of peace and safety. Amen. As the people who believe in Christ in the period, we have a definite message to bear, prepared to meet it by God. Our message must be as direct as that of was that of John. He rebuked kings for their iniquity, notwithstanding the peril his life was in, he never allowed truth to languish on his lips. Our work in this age must be as faithfully done. Yeah. I can't quote it perfectly, but Brother Dwayne in the past couple of days told me, um, maybe he told all of us, and maybe we already know this, that he read a passage where William Miller said, when you're going to wield the sword, don't put no silk cloth on it, because your enemy will take courage about it. <laughs> and William Miller, I told you the quote I was going to read it in the morning. Oh. Oh. I'm so sorry. That wasn't purposeful. I just liked that quote, especially when I read this. I quoted very badly. He was quoted badly. My point, my point was, is that he was a type of Elijah. He was a type of John the Baptist. Amen. And we have a more appointed message in John the Baptist. So that history is repeated. Next quote. Say it is working that the history of the Jewish nation may be repeated in the experience of those who can claim to believe present truth. The Jews had the Old Testament scriptures and supposed themselves conversant with them, but they made a woeful mistake. The prophecies that refer to the glorious second appearing of Christ and the clouds of heaven they regarded as referring to his first coming, because he did not come according to their expectations. They turned away from him. Satan knew just how to take these men in his net and to see them destroy them. Now we've already mentioned that Sardis, well, well let, let's just read it. This manuscript released in volume 18, page 193. Oh, what a description. How many there are in this spiritual condition. I earnestly entreat every ministry, minister, to study diligently the third chapter of Revelation, for in it is portrayed the condition of things existing in these last days. What does the third chapter of Revelation address? Which churches? Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. She's saying Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea portray the condition of things existing in these last days. And here you have a quote by Joseph Bates underneath this, where he will describe <coughs> Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea as contemporary churches in the Millerite history. In all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. God says he, God says he will bring the third part through the fire and refine them. They, they shall call upon him and he will hear them. Here we say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. First part, Sardis, the nominal church for Babylon. Second part, Laodicea, the nominal address. Third part, Philadelphia, the only true church of God on earth, for they ask to be translated to the city of God. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I exhort you again to flee from the Laodiceans as far as from Sodom and Gomorrah. Their teachings are false and delusive and lead to utter destruction, death. Death, eternal death, is on their track. Remember Lot's wife. So he's portraying all three churches as contemporary. And if he is correct, and we have evidence, we have evidence to say that he is correct, as those three churches being contemporary, if he's not correct on every aspect of it, then because the Millerite history is to be repeated, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea will be repeated in the history 
of the AFC. So you'll notice from uh, Taylor Bunch, uh, who's a contemporary Adventist, he's not a pioneer, a book called The Seven Epistles of Christ. Sardis not only re re represents those escaping or that which remains after the great apostasy and terrible persecution of the Middle Ages, but some authorities believe that the word artist means remnant or of an escaped few, and therefore represent Protestantism as after what had, was vital in it had evaporated so that there are only a few faithful ones remaining. There would be a remnant who would continue to the work of reform even after the Reformation had waned and Protestantism in general was dead. There would be a few names or a few souls in Sardis who had not defiled their garments. And although I'm not making the application that Elder Bunch is making here, I'm using his definition of Sardis to line up with Daniel 11.41 because we see Eden, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon escaping the hand of the papacy in that verse at the Sunday law. And therefore, they would qualify as Sardis, while the Laodiceans and Adventism receive the mark of the beast, and the Philadelphians and Adventism receive the seal of God. We're talking about experience here, not history of the Christian church. So, what I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, is this that the seals, the church's seals and trumpets, are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge, and enlarge, with some qualification, all right? The first four seals repeat the history or are run parallel with the history of the first four churches. But there's a distinction between the first four seals and the last three seals. Okay, so I'm not saying the last three seals run contemporary with the last three churches. I'll stand with James White, who has been identified as Moses in terms of Bible doctrine to the Advent people. Okay, and I'm going to say it up to one friend so you all get to hear that. Um, the, the repeat and enlarge also functions with the seven trumpets, but the seven trumpets do not come into the history until after the <coughs> removing of the capital of Rome to Constantinople by Constantine. Remember that, that is being partially governed, governed at least by the principle of national apostasies followed by national ruin. He passes the Sunday law in 321, in the year 330, the kingdoms divided in east and west, like Brother Jamal was set in court today, and shortly thereafter, the first four trumpets come into history, and by 476, they've taken out Western Rome. So they're, they're working upon repeating and large, but they don't come into history until the time period of Pergamos, and then they do follow Repeat and large trumpets, the six trumpets coming to a conclusion in 1844. So they're operating upon the principle of repeat and large, um, but that when you look at it closely, all seven of the churches, all the history of the seven churches are repeated in the history of Laodicea. Now, Pascal has a book on, on Revelation, and these are some quote from Haskell's book on Revelation, so maybe if you're thinking that what you're hearing here is a little bit heretical, you're going to find that this has been around since the time of Ellen White. Page 69 from Sir Patmos, Stephen Haskell says, it should be remembered, I'm on the top of page 132, it should be remembered that as the experience of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamus will be repeated in the last church, before the second coming of Christ, so the history of Thyatira will have its counterpart in the last generation. <coughs> On page 75, he said, he applied the, t the test, but all pointed forward to the year 1843. Who's, who's, who applied the test? William Miller. William Miller applied the test, but all pointed forward to the year 1843 is the time when the world must welcome its Savior. The condition of the people at the first advent of Christ was now repeated. That's what Sister White says in early writings, page 259. The history of Ephesus is repeated in the history of Philadelphia, but we know the history of Philadelphia is repeated in the history of Laodicea. And page 75, Haskell further says, there was a time in the history of Pergamos when Christianity thought paganism was dead, but in reality, the religion which was apparently vanquished had conquered. Paganism baptized stepped into the church. In the days of Sardis, in this history, 
was repeated. Upon this last church, the remnant, shine the accumulated rays of all past ages. This testimony of our name, page 301, says the solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention. Precious time is rapidly passing, and there is a danger that many will be robbed of the time which should be given to the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to the fallen world. Satan is pleased to see the diversion of minds that should be engaged in the study of the truths which have to do with eternal realities. The testimony of Christ, a testimony of the most solemn character, is to be born to the world. All through the book of Revelation, there are most precious, elevating promises, and there are also warnings of the most fearfully solemn import. Will not those who profess to have a knowledge of the truth read the testimony given to John by Christ? Here is no guesswork, no scientific deception. Here are truths that concern our present and future where welfare, fair, what is the chaff to the wheat? And let me draw a couple conclusions and, and be done. How many remember the quote that we have referred to more than once in Great Controversy where Sister White says, the events connected with the close of probation and the need of preparation for the time of trouble have been clearly revealed, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. How many remember that quote that we dealt with that? The events connected with the close of probation are the last six verses of Daniel 11. Because in Daniel 12, 1, the very next verse, Michael stands up and human probation closes. The events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed. Therefore, the events that lead to the close of probation are the last six verses of Daniel 11, and the events that lead to the close of probation are the events that take place in the history of what church? Laodicea. The history of Laodicea. Therefore, the events connected with closed probation, the last six verses of Daniel 11, that take place in Laodicea, have also already been fulfilled in the Millerite history, Amen. in here. Correct? We've been looking at that all week long. And, and we just established that. Philadelphia is repeating in Laodicea. Correct? Amen. So, In the history of Philadelphia, when the mighty angel comes down and he has a little book open in his hand, I want to put one concept in your mind. And the, the Millerites at this point eat the little book, but by the time they get to 1844, it's bitter in their stomach. And then the, that experience is put in the record books. That experience is the experience of Laodicea. And although you may not follow this, and I'm not going to go too far with this, but I do want you to internalize this thought. This little book, Sister White says, the book that was sealed was not the Revelation, but that portion of the book of Daniel that related to the last the book that was sealed was not the revelation, but that portion of the book of Daniel which related to the last days. What portion of the book of Daniel relates to the last days? Okay. That's what was sealed up. But it was unsealed in this history. It was unsealed in this history. Because this history of the Millerites illustrated that portion of Daniel that was sealed up. Amen. It illustrated Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It's opened up in this history. It's the little book. But in, in Revelation chapter 5, 
the book that's in the Father's hand, we've already checked this out, the book that's in the Father's hand, the seal of the seven seals, that Christ takes, the line of the tribe of Judah, and he begins to unseal. When we, when we let Sister White define what that book was, what was it? The Word of God. It was the Bible. But when Christ comes down here, with the little book opening his hand, it's the book of Dan. Yes. It's the little book. Yes. And why is the little book? Because this history <coughs> illustrates every history Amen. in the Word of God. And when we bring line upon line together, it takes the Bible and brings it into the pattern of Daniel and it turns it into a little book. Amen. <laughs> So when the mighty angel comes down in Revelation 18, just as he came down here, he comes down with the little book of Daniel opening his hand, signifying that at this point in history, the 144,000 are going to understand what the little book is. And the little book is the fact that all the histories are repeated in the history of the Amen. Brothers and sisters, so you get that concept. You can't, you have to follow Christ through the candlesticks to get that concept. And once you're at that point walking through the sanctuary with Christ, then he takes us somewhere else. And what we're going to attempt to show you tomorrow is that the seven churches that represent the history of the Christian church all seven of the churches illustrate the history of ancient Israel. By the way, the history, the history of the disciples, the history of Christ, what history is that? Is it Sardis, Philadelphia? What history is it? It's Ephesus. But Ephesus is the end of ancient Israel, is it not? Amen. But based upon these lines, the end of ancient Israel is identical to the beginning of ancient Israel, is it not? Amen. So Ephesus of the disciples is Ephesus in the history of the Do you see it? We've read a quote here. You know, I made a point. I didn't say anything, but we've read it more than once. It's in your notes. Your sister White compares the captivity of the Jews in Babylon for 70 years with the captivity of spiritual Israel in spiritual Babylon during the 1260 years. Do you remember that quote from Patriarchs and Prophets? The 70 year captivity of ancient Israel in Babylon is paralleling the 1260 years captivity of the Christians with spiritual battle. And you know, you know this is a parallel history. Because when the Jews came out of Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem, there were how many decrees? Three. And at the third decree, what started? The 2300 year prophecy. And where does the 2300 year prophecy end? It ends on the third message after they come out of spiritual battle. They come out of literal Babylon, and on three decrees, we start the 2300 day prophecy. And when they come out of spiritual Babylon, the prophecy ends on the third message. There is no way that these aren't parallel histories. There's too much, there, except you see it. Such a white lady says it. She says the captivity of the Jews in Babylon during the 70 years parallels the captivities of the Christians during the Dark Ages. You remember that quote? Do you see the point? The point is, what is the 1260 years? I tried, I tried, I tried. The seven years of captivity is starting hard in the ancient Israel. Where is the end the beginning? Where is the end the beginning? In ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel. But, why? Why did the Christian church go into captivity in Thyatira? It was cause and effect. Why did they compromise? Constantine brought into idolatry. Why did the Jews go into captivity in Babylon? Idolatry and compromise. That was permanent for the Jews. The seven churches illustrate the history of ancient Israel. 
and the Christian church. So brothers and sisters, we just demonstrated that all seven churches are fulfilled in the way of the So all the history of ancient Israel is repeated in the way of the Because it's the same history. But the one daily is a noun. Okay. That's why the daily is a noun. Anyway, that's where we're going tomorrow. Because once you see that pattern, there's some very significant truths that come to light. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you began to open the book of Revelation up to us here at the end of the world to the very simple principle of the seven thunders. That the history of the Miller Rites is repeated in the history of the 144,000. And we recognize that this key that you've unsealed here just before probation is allowing us to bring the testimonies of the prophets right down to the present day. And we ask that you would give us the discernment to understand what this means to us, what the implications are, and to take those lessons that are illustrated in those past histories and bring them to bear upon our personal experience and upon the work that we attempt to accomplish for you. We thank you for the time that you've been with us these days. And ask for your continued presence throughout the rest of this evening and throughout the rest of these meetings. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.